Jazzy TV. What do we owe God? People ask me, Martin Zender, what do I owe God for all he's done for me? Well, you don't owe him anything, but I'll tell you what he likes. I'll tell you what he loves. I can feel it coming on. Hang on. God loves gratitude. Thanksgiving. That's not so hard. You really can't truly thank God unless you attribute everything you have to him, including your belief. What am I thankful for today? I'll tell you what I'm thankful for today. First of all, I'm thankful that you are here at MZTV. This is Martin Zender. I'm your host. I'm the world's most outspoken Bible scholar, voted in unanimously, and rightly so. I make sense for a living. I'm thankful for this new gadget I got for my night runs. Now, I know you folks don't want anything bad to happen to me, so I run... I run twice a day my second run at night. It's, it's very relaxing, but, um, you know, you do tend to get run over by cars. So I, I got this brand new, I got this, I also have a vest that glows, you know, but I, I have this light. Now watch this. This is, I know that's ridiculous, but that's high beam. If you're watching the uh, kitchen cam, that's high beam. There's medium beam. That's a little more reasonable, low beam, right? I got the star Bethlehem on my forehead. But it, it impresses cars. And if anybody has their brights out trying to blind me, I can fight back. I fight back like this. See, I just put my head like this. And then I'll give them the one, I'll give them the big, I'll give them the full treatment. Yeah, and when I do this, they think they're seeing a vision. They think, they think they're seeing Christ on the road to Damascus. Oh, speaking of that, uh, speaking of that and Thanksgiving, I got to tell you about Paul, the Apostle Paul, our favorite apostle. He has a great praise and thanksgiving to God here in 1 Timothy. There's so much treasure here in 1 Timothy. You know, my one of my favorite books of Scripture is, is 2 Timothy. And because of that, eh, yeah, okay, I might be guilty of maybe not bringing out all the treasure I could from 1 Timothy. I'm going to change that starting today. Maybe tomorrow, who knows? We'll see. Listen to Paul. His first letter to Timothy, chapter 1. And verse 12, grateful am I to him. Grateful. There we go. Thanksgiving. Grateful am I to him, capital H, who invigorates me, Christ. Gives me the energy for everything I do. There, I, I can't tell you how many verses eliminate the false teaching of human free will. This is one of them. Christ who invigorates me. Gives me the energy. That means if you don't have the energy, that's of Christ too. He invigorates me a lot, or he invigorates me a little. It's all, it's all him doing it. Grateful am I to him who invigorates me, Christ Jesus our Lord, for he deems me faithful, assigning me a service. Christ Jesus, we know, as I just showed you on the road to Damascus, I mean, when you see something like this coming at you, you're being assigned a service. Paul was being assigned a service, deeming me faithful, assigning me a service who formerly, Paul, speaking of himself, was a calumniator, that is a blasphemer, a persecutor. So he, th he said bad things about God, and he couldn't stand the people who worshiped God and Jesus Christ, an outrager. I'm going to show you in a few brief moments that this man was the worst sinner on the face of the earth. You remember I told you that little uh, meeting I had with Juliana's friend? She did what everybody else does, brings up Hitler. Yeah, but what about Hitler? Well, you're not telling me God saved Hitler. They shouldn't use Hitler as the example. You know who they should use? Saul the Pharisee. You remember what I told her? She says, I don't want to be with Hitler for, uh, up in heaven. Well, you know what? Hitler doesn't want to be with you either. But, but here's the thing. It's not going to be Hitler as you know him from the history books. It's going to be the new and improved Hitler. Just like Saul the Pharisee was the new and improved man. This lady was all crazy about admitting, yeah, well, yeah, I'd like to be with Paul the Apostle. What about Saul the Pharisee? Oh, God, no, I don't want to be with that stupid guy. And what, what's the difference? A change. So he was formerly a persecutor, formerly an outrager, formerly a calumniator. 
But I was shown mercy, seeing that I do it being ignorant in unbelief. Ignorant in unbelief. Ignorant, I want to catch these two things first. Ignorant in unbelief. We were once ignorant in unbelief. Adolf Hitler was ignorant in unbelief. Hey, wait a minute. Can you name one person in this world, in world history, who has ever not ignorant and in unbelief? No one's seeking out God. Romans 3, no one's righteous, no, not one. They have all gone, gone out of their way. They all avoid him. It's universal. But Paul is just giving a personal testimony here. He's one guy testifying to this fact that God takes people who are unbelievers and ignorant and has mercy on them. Now, he doesn't just have mercy on them. We know he justifies the entire human race, but right now we're looking at this particular aspect of mercy. It's a relative aspect. The absolute is that everyone's justified. God's ju justified in all his works and everything's operating in accord with the will of God, yes. You might be tempted to say, well... <laughs> Paul says God only had mercy on him because he was ignorant in unbelief. Had he been not ignorant and full of belief, then God wouldn't have had mercy on him. But, but God wouldn't have had to have had mercy on him. Think of it that way. Besides, Romans 11.32, here it is. God locks up all together in stubbornness that he should be merciful to all. So everyone is in the same boat that this Pharisee Saul was, ignorant and unbelief and stubborn. God is locked up all together in stubbornness. Why? So he should have mercy on all. Why does he bring up mercy here and not justification? Justification is kind of a high word. It's kind of a cold word. We don't get this nice warm feeling from justification. But here's a word we do get a nice warm feeling from, and that is mercy. Mercy. Mercy, please. Mercy feels good. Mercy is like a warm word. We're still justified, but mercy is a warm syrup that drips down into the chambers of your heart and soul, bathes your brain in good feelings, gives you a mercy high from which you never drop down, not like an, insul not like an insulin hit or a sugar hit. No, it keeps going. So God was merciful to me. He's merciful to all. But here's the thing. There's one difference with Saul the Pharisee that you're not going to find with everybody else in Romans chapter 11, verse 32. Yet the grace of our Lord over all. I was shown mercy. I was shown mercy, seeing that I do it being ignorant in unbelief. Yeah, newsflash. Thanks, Paul. Just like everybody else on the planet. Yeah, just like everybody else on the planet with one important difference. Yet the grace of our Lord overwhelms with faith and love in Christ Jesus. The grace of Christ overwhelms. Let me ask anybody out there looking over your shoulder, because I know none of you qualify for this, who believes in free will, who believes in human free will, which is false teaching. The grace of God overwhelmed this man, while he was while he was an outrager, while he was ignorant, while he was in unbelief, this is why I told you last week Jesus Christ never saved a believer. He can only save people who are in unbelief because there's no exception to unbelief. Belief comes after salvation, not before it. But the Lord overwhelmed Saul. Let me ask you this. If I don't, have anybody ever been to Niagara Falls? All right, good. So if, if you're coming, imagine walking under Niagara Falls and not getting wet. Eh, try to imagine. I'm going to will myself to walk under Niagara Falls and not get wet. I use that analogy because of the word overwhelms. The grace of God overwhelmed this man. It gushed over him. It gave him no opportunity to do anything but be struck blind to become very introspective and to change the man from a stubborn man to a cooperative man, from an unbelieving man to a believer. It overwhelmed him. It, it, it was like, it wasn't an invitation to believe. Like Billy Graham says, don't pray for these people. Is that a Billy Graham? No, that's terrible. More of a twang. Don't pray for these people. That's not it either. 
All right, I'm just going to go with it. Don't pray for these people. You need to leave them alone right now because they need to come of their own volition. We don't need God to overwhelm them with anything because if God overwhelms somebody, then they, he necessarily takes away their free will. It, that's true. If, you are, if you're overwhelmed, how is it that you have exercised a free will? You haven't. It's impossible. Overwhelms with faith and love. Faith is a gift. Christ Jesus gave Paul faith, and he injected love into his Grinch-like heart, and it grew ten times that day. Then he says this, Faithful is the saying, and worthy of all welcome. I could just analyze every single word here, but I can't do it for time's sake, otherwise... I'd be making a two-hour video, and I could do it easily. I'd love to do it, because once I turn on this camera, I get on a roll. <laughs> but nobody's going to look at a two-hour video and go, yeah. too much, too much, from too much. Christ Jesus, faithful is the saying. This is our saying, this is my saying, and worthy of all welcome that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Well, there's a new concept. I wonder if it worked. That's our whole belief of the salvation of all stems from this. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Why is that such a crazy concept? And we believe that he was successful. He saves sinners, not believers. This is what I'm telling you. Of course, the mainstream church tells you you have to stop being a sinner for just a second. Can you stop being a stupid sinner for just a second? Can you stop being stubborn? Can you stop being uncooperative for just a second long enough to do a marvelous act of righteousness, namely believe in Jesus Christ. So they're asking you to stop sinning long enough to believe in Jesus, which is the farthest thing from a sin, and yet at the same time declaring that Jesus Christ saves sinners. No, be consistent. I know I'm asking a lot. Jesus Christ saves cooperative people. Jesus Christ saves those who can at least stop sinning long enough to believe in him. No, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Here it is, foremost of whom am I? Foremost of whom am I? Paul is here admitting that he was the chief of the sinners. Other translations I say, I think, say chief. I was the chief of the sinners. Paul says he's the foremost. So tell your friends, I don't want to hear any more. What about Hitler? Don't tell me God saved Hitler. Don't give me any more of that because Paul Saul the Pharisee was the foremost sinner. Well, yeah, but Martin Zander, Adolf Hitler lived after Paul. Got had no idea how stubborn Adolf Hitler was going to be. Yeah. Because Adolf Hitler came after this crazy Pharisee on the way to Damascus to kill Christians. Is that right? Well, confront this then. Christ came into the world to save sinners, foremost of whom am I, but therefore was I shown mercy. Therefore, what do you mean therefore? What does the therefore refer to? It refers to what just went before, which is foremost. I was the foremost of sinners. Paul was a formidable case of stubbornness and unbelief. He was the bastion of everything against God. By the way, was Hitler ever persecuting God? No, he was persecuting the, Jew, the, the Israel types. He wasn't against God. Saul was an enemy of God. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I love repeating that part. Can't say it enough foremost the first the chief foremost of whom am i but therefore that is because i was the foremost therefore was i shown mercy that in me the foremost jesus christ watch this should be displaying all his patience for a pattern of those who are about to be believing in him for life aeonian that's a mouthful. Paul is considering now life Aeonian. He's considering Aeonian life. He's not looking right now at the salvation of all. Doesn't mean that's not true. He's just talking about those who get the early call, which is Aeonian life. 
Yeah, I'm going to send this back. It didn't work. <clears throat> Sorry. I want to talk about the pattern. I might have to do that tomorrow. For now, let me end with this. That in me, Jesus Christ should be displaying all his patience. If we're going to talk about the patience of Christ, if we're going to talk about the tolerance of the Son of God for abject stubbornness and unbelief, every iota of the patience, the waiting, this is all speaking relatively now, the endurance of Jesus Christ was spent on this lunatic. All God's patience was all of Jesus Christ's patience was required, every single iota of it. And you would think that he'd have a hell of a lot. Patience is one of the fruits of the Spirit. He had the Spirit without measure. And now we're speaking of him not in his earthly Jew suit, but exalted at the right hand of God. And Paul says that he should be displaying in me all his patience. Saul became a canvas for a painting of a masterpiece of the patience of Jesus Christ, and he exhausted all of it on this guy. And the result was that it was enough. It was enough because this man was changed to the greatest champion of Jesus Christ. Wow. Nobody else in history will, will or would or could call upon more patience and tolerance than Saul the Pharisee. Nobody. Because I'm reading here that all of Jesus Christ's patience was expended upon this lunatic. Every other case after that is easy because this is the poster boy. This is the poster boy for mercy, poster boy for grace, poster boy for the patience of Jesus Christ, poster boy for the salvation of all. That's my term. That's a Zender term, poster boy. The scriptural term is a pattern. I am a pattern. Paul is not the exception. How many times have I heard that? Well, yeah, true. Saul the Pharisee didn't have time to exercise his free will. Yes, okay, we admitted that in this particular case, they do this the same with Pharaoh. Yes, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but that was an exceptional case. God doesn't do that with everybody. They say the same thing with this guy. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, God exercises patience, but with us, he gives us an opportunity to believe. No, Saul became a pattern of those about to be believing. In this context, he's talking about Aeonian life. But is this not the pattern for everybody else that would come to believe in Christ, which is everybody? Seeing that as an Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For sure. For sure. So, my friends, and those who are looking over your shoulder, and those who would argue with you about Adolf Hitler, get off the Hitler kick. Let's talk about the worst sinner that ever lived. Let's talk about the foremost. Let's talk about the man who required all of the patience of Christ, and that is Saul the Pharisee. Let's talk about him. That's the poster boy. That's the template. And I make a motion today that this man, Saul the Pharisee, be substituted from this day forward for Adolf Hitler as the ultimate example of the saving power of God.